and they just immediately reached out. And so I'm thankful for the body of Christ. I'm thankful for the church. Isaiah chapter 10 and verse 24, the Bible says, Therefore thus saith the Lord God of hosts, O my people that dwellest in Zion, be not afraid of the Assyrian. He shall smite thee with a rod and shall lift up his staff against thee after the manner of Egypt. For yet a very little while, and the indignation shall cease, and mine anger and their destruction. And the Lord of hosts shall stir up a scourge for him, according to the slaughter of Midian at the rock of Oreb. And as his rod was upon the sea, so shall he lift it up after the manner of Egypt. Verse 27, and it shall come to pass. Somebody say it shall. It shall come to pass in that day that his burden shall be taken away from off thy shoulder and his yoke from off thy neck and the yoke shall be destroyed because of the anointing. Amen. I'd simply like to preach to you here today this. God's church is anointed. Anybody know that God's church is an anointed church? I believe I'm in a Pentecostal church today, a church that believes in the Pentecostal experience, the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Amen. This church belongs to the Lord. This church is anointed by God. I wonder if you would one more time help me pray and let's ask God to have his way today. Lord, in the name of Jesus, I thank you, God. I thank you, Lord, for the power that we have felt in this place, Lord. And God, I pray again for the anointing of the Holy Ghost. I pray for your anointing to preach your word today. And I pray let your anointing fall upon every heart and upon every ear, Lord. God, we desire the liberty of the Holy Ghost that you would sweep all over this house. I pray that your spirit could freely minister into every heart and every home in every life. Uh, in the name of Jesus, we pray. I wonder one more time, could we clap our hands unto the Lord and give him praise? Man, praise God. God bless you as you're seated in the presence of the Lord. I am thankful more than anything else, and I believe it is the highest privilege that any person could have to be counted a part of the church of the living God. I don't believe there's anything I could be more thankful for than that I can be a part of the church. Now, I think we understand that the church is not a building, but if you'd allow me to say it this way, I'm thankful that I was raised in the church. I'm glad, I'm thankful that I grew up in a home where uh, there was never a question of whether or not we would be at church. I just knew that on Sunday morning, we were going to be at church. On Sunday night, we would be back at church. I knew on Wednesday, we would be at church. I knew if there was a prayer meeting, a revival, or a a potluck, didn't matter. If the doors of the church were open, I just knew my family was going to be at church. And, uh, you know, my parents didn't even have to verbally tell me that it was important because beyond that, it was just pattern in our lifestyle. I didn't have a say in it. If I was living under their roof, It was just how we lived life. We were going to be at the house of God. And so I just knew that there was nothing on our schedule or in our agenda that was more important than being faithful to the house of the Lord. But I I can still remember the night. It was a Sunday night service. As a nine-year-old boy, I remember that night when I received something that I could not receive just because of where I attended church. I remember as a nine-year-old boy, I was sitting in the second pew, those old maroon-colored pews we had in Bellevue, Nebraska. I was sitting in the middle section right about there, and I didn't even make it down to the altar. But at nine years old, I lifted up my hands, and as I began to pray, God filled me with the baptism of the Holy Ghost. And I began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gives the utterance, just like the Bible says. And it was at that same time that I was baptized in the name of Jesus. And so it was in that moment when I was born of the water and of the spirit, it was in that moment that I became a part of the church. For Jesus said, if any man wants to see or enter into the kingdom of heaven, he must be born of the water and of the spirit. But I'm also thankful that God does not care if you were raised in church or not. That there's never a bad time, there's never a wrong time to join the church. In fact, Jesus told a parable in Matthew chapter 20. Jesus told a parable and he likened the kingdom of heaven unto a man who owned a vineyard. 
And he said the owner of the vineyard, he went out in the very early morning hours of the day into the public square in the marketplace and he began to search and he began to look and, and try to find to see if there was anybody that was available to come and work in the vineyard. And Jesus said the owner of the vineyard, he, he went out throughout the day at the third hour and the sixth hour and the ninth hour. He continued to go out and just see is there anybody that's available to come. And I do believe it is worth noting that the owner of the vineyard, he, he did not ask people for their resume. He didn't ask them for their, their qualifications. He, he, he wasn't looking to see, well, where have you been and, and who have you been associated with? But all he wanted to know is right now, are you available to come and work in the vineyard? And if they were available, he said, then come, I've got a place for you. And then Jesus said he went out even in the 11th hour. He went back out one more time, the very last hour of the day to work. And he, he went one more time to see if there was anybody else that would be available to come and work in the vineyard. And I'm thankful today that we serve an 11th hour God. That he doesn't care what place of life you're in, what stage you're at, what age you are. All he wants to know is are you available to come and work in the vineyard? In fact, it was in the fall of last year, I went to a funeral of a woman who, she was, I believe, in her 50s, and, and this was someone that I had grown up with her kids in youth group, and, and her whole family, they had been a part of the church where I grew up, a very, a very involved family in the church, but as her kids grew older and they began to make their own decisions, they began to walk away from the Lord, and then her and her husband followed after, and they drifted away from God, and her husband just unexpectedly walked in to the room and found her unexpectedly had passed away there lying on the floor. And her, her pastor, though, he told me, he said just a few weeks before she had passed away, he said all by herself, nobody else in her family had come, but, but just her. She had come back to the house of God and she had come down to an altar and she had prayed back through in the Holy Ghost. And he told me, he said, the last memory I have of her was on the Sunday morning before the Lord took her home. I walked into the prayer room and there she was next to her sister and they were praying in the Holy Holy Ghost uh, on that Sunday morning. And so I'm thankful that even in the 11th hour of her life, uh, she didn't even know that it was her time, uh, but the Lord had begun to draw her heart back unto him. Hallelujah. Doesn't matter. Jesus just wants to know, are you available? In fact, he told another parable. Jesus told a parable. He said, the kingdom of heaven is like a man who threw a great supper, a great banquet. And the invitations had already gone out. People had been invited to come. But one by one, they began to have excuses why they were no longer available. They said, well, I've, I've, I've bought land. I've gotten married. I, this and that has happened. I'm no longer available. I'm no longer able to come to the banquet. And, and, the, and Jesus said the man became very angry. And he sent his servants out. And he said, you go out into the streets and into the lanes of the city. And you bring in the halt and the maimed and the poor and the blind. And you bring them to my banquet. And Jesus said when they had done it, they came back and they said, Lord, there's still room in the house. And he said, you go out again into the highways and the hedges and compel them to come that my house be filled. Can I tell you, it is the will of God that his house be filled. And he's not looking for any certain kind of person. He just wants to know if there's anybody that's hungry, if there's anybody with the desire, if there's anybody that would just say, Lord, I'm available. I, I don't feel like I have much to offer. I don't feel like I've gotten much on my resume. But, Lord, I, I'm here and I'll make myself available to you. In fact, what was striking about the parable of the man with the vineyard is that Jesus said at the end of the day, he paid every laborer the same wage. Now, I don't know about you, but any job I've ever worked, any, any place I've ever been a part of, company I've been at, if I showed up at 4 p.m. and I clocked out at 5 and the boss publicly paid me the same amount as everybody who had been working all day long, I don't know about you, but that would create some issues. That would cause some problems. But Jesus established that in his kingdom kingdom of God does not operate the way that an earthly kingdom operates and the church does not function the way that the world functions and that's because the church is not a work of man but it is a work of the spirit if you've been around church for a long time you if you maybe were raised in it the way that I was it's possible that you know you, you just you've been around it so long it's like Uzzah walking next to the ark 
And that ark had been in his father's house for 20 years, and so it just began to seem like just another piece of furniture. And so there he was walking alongside the ark, and and his intentions were good. He thought, well, I'm just going to study it because it's being shaken, and I don't want it to fall, and thought that his intentions were right. But somewhere along the way, he had lost a reverence for what was so holy unto the Lord. And God had commanded never to place your hand upon the ark, but but he had been around it so long in his father's house, it didn't really seem maybe all that special anymore. And, and you can be around church so long, it, maybe it just begins to seem a little ordinary, a little natural, but the church is not ordinary. The church is not natural. It is supernatural. And when the church was birthed, something took place that had never happened before in the history of the world. It had never happened before. And it was already mentioned, Brother Sabochi mentioned it to us already today, that what took place on that day of Pentecost, the Bible says in Acts chapter 2, that, that on the day of Pentecost, when it was fully come, they were all with one accord and in one place. And suddenly... There came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind and it filled all the house where they were sitting and there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire and it set upon each of them and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And So I tell you today that the life of the church comes from the Spirit of God. The drive of the church comes from the Spirit of God. The direction for the church comes from the Spirit of God. That the church, it goes beyond a building, goes beyond a denomination, goes beyond an organization. Because the church is not defined by man, but the church has been defined by God. That it is by one Spirit that we have been baptized into one body. For there is one God and Father of all, who is above all, and He's through all, and He's in you all. And so we are many members, but we are one body. We are many congregations, but we are one church. And God's church is anointed. God's church is a triumphant church. God's church does not bow to the whims of culture. It is not pulled by the tides of the world. But God's church has been fitly framed together. Being built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, And we have this promise that the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I take you to the book of Colossians chapter 1 and verse 16. In which the Bible says, for by him were all things created. Somebody say all things. That are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible. Whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things. Somebody say all things were created by him and for him. And he is before, there it is, all things. Somebody say all things. And by him, all things consist. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead. That in all things, he might have the preeminence. For it pleased the Father that in him should all fullness dwell. Jesus Christ, he is the head of the church, that this church, uh, it belongs to him. And so the church has a destination for victory. And, And really, if I could just say this, we serve a sovereign God. He is in control of all things. He is the head of all things. And I don't have time this morning to go into all of the intricacies of the sovereignty of God. But if I could just give you that scripture enough to let us know it is God who is in charge and in control. And in the book of Isaiah chapter 10, it gives us this glimpse into the sovereignty of God. Just gives us this window where we we just peer for a moment and we see just a little bit of God's sovereignty And the Bible says in Isaiah chapter 10 that Isaiah prophesies that because of sin that had entered into Israel, God was going to use the Assyrians for judgment and allow them to conquer Israel. Because every time that sin enters into a life, it brings with it death. Sin, when it is finished, only produces one thing. It produces death. And so... 
Israel was going to be conquered by the Assyrians and there was the evil king of Assyria whose name was Sennacherib, but Isaiah declares that Sennacherib would fail to understand who he was in relationship to God and all of the earth. And Sennacherib would believe that he had somehow been able to uh, accomplish it on his own. And so we read in Isaiah chapter 10 and verse 13. In Isaiah chapter 10 and verse 13, it records of what Sennacherib would say. For he would say, by the strength of my hand, I have done it. And by my wisdom, for I am prudent and have removed the bounds of the people. And have robbed their treasures, and I have put down the inhabitants like a valiant man. And my hand hath found as a nest the riches of the people. And as one gathereth the eggs that are left, have I gathered all the earth. And there was none that moved the wing or opened the mouth or peeped. That Sennacherib would, would accomplish all of this, and he would begin to say, Well, look at what I have been able to do. By my might and by my ability, by my wisdom and by my intellect, I have been able to conquer and gather all the earth unto myself. Look at the success that I have had by my own hand and, and by my own ability. But in verse 15, we very quickly see God's thoughts on this kind of thinking. Verse 15, God says, Shall the axe boast itself against him that heweth therewith? Or shall the saw magnify itself against them that shaketh it, as if the rod should shake itself against them that lift it up, or as if the staff should lift up itself as if it were not wood? Now, I wish I had an axe here with me today. Did anybody bring an axe with you to church this morning? Or a saw? Nobody brought an axe or a saw. But if you just picture an axe, that what is it? It is a, a tool that was created by man. It's a piece of metal and lumber, wood, that was fastened together. And it was created with a specific purpose, a specific intention in mind. And it can do nothing on its own until the lumberjack takes hold of the axe and begins to swing it at the tree. It, it just lays there lifeless, dormant unable to accomplish anything. And it would truly be foolish to really, really believe that an axe would even be able to boast against the one that wields the axe. It would, maybe if I was a child and I was imagining in my mind, that is all that it would be. And the saw, is again, it's just another tool that was created. And it's not until the carpenter takes hold of the saw and begins to put that saw in motion that it can ever do what it was created to do. And it's not until God takes hold of the church and begins to put us in motion that we can ever do what we were created to do. And you and I, we were created by God. That's how we are. We are created beings by God. And it's not until you allow God, the creator who made you, to take hold of your life and to begin to put you in motion that you can never do what you are created to do. There is a lie of this world that wants to tell people that you're just here by accident, you're just here by coincidence, and life is just chance, and life has no meaning and no value and no purpose, and you're just meant to wander aimlessly through life, not sure where you're at, not sure what you're supposed to be doing, but can I tell you that when God formed you and when he made you, he made you with a purpose, he, he made you with intention, God sees you exactly where you are, he has never lost sight of you and he has a purpose for your life he wants to get glory from your life and so if you want God to get glory from your life then you just got to make that your prayer Lord breathe on me the breath of life Lord I need the anointing of the Holy Ghost upon my life for Jesus said without me you can do nothing to think that I could somehow do it on my own would be no different than an axe or a saw that would try to boast in itself. Uh, no, I can't do it on my own. Uh, but when the anointing of the Holy Ghost rests upon you. Oh, would you clap your hands unto the Lord? But Sennacherib, he didn't understand that. He failed to understand where he stood. He didn't understand uh, what Colossians 1.16 gives us. Uh, he, he didn't realize that all he was uh, was he was a pawn on the board. 
He just happened to be at the right place at the right time. God just used him because he could have used anybody else. Uh, The kingdom of God is bigger than any one individual. It's bigger than any one family. God could bypass me in a moment. He he can use me if I make myself available, but he could go right on to the next one. All I am is a vessel that's saying, Lord, here I am. God, you could use me. But perhaps for Israel in that moment, it may not have felt like God was sovereign. Because the Bible says there was a yoke that was upon them. Yoke is just a piece of lumber that was designed to be placed upon the neck of an oxen to be able to control and harness them. And it has become a symbol of oppression. And so the Bible was declaring that there was an oppression upon his people because of the enemy. And so maybe Israel would have thought, well... This was my own fault. It was by our own choice that we made that now we've got to live with this yoke upon us. Maybe it would just seem this is our new reality to live life this way. It's our own decision that we made. It was by our own sin. So now we just got to walk uh, under the weight of this yoke. I don't know who may have come into this house today with the yoke upon your life. I don't know who may have stepped into this place and maybe maybe there's a yoke that you've been carrying because of yesterday's regrets and yesterday's failures. And maybe you're looking at your life and you're saying, no, God can't do anything with this. All I've done is make a mess of my life. Uh, All I've got behind me is a stream of failure and mistake and of sin. And and because of the yoke that I've got upon my life, uh, I can't even feel the presence of the Lord. Uh, Because of the yoke that I've been carrying, I I can't even respond uh, in worship unto the Lord. Because of the yoke uh, that I've been carrying, I I don't have a passion and a zeal anymore. Because of the yoke uh, that I've got upon my life. It just seems like uh, it's just taking me every step of the way, doing everything I can to take another step. And it just seems like this is the way that I'm going to live my life with this new burden upon me. But God, he told his people, and he told them this before it ever happened. Isaiah prophesied this to them before it ever took place. That God saw where they would go and who they would be. And he already made a plan for them. That Jesus Christ, he is the lamb that was slain from the foundation of the world. And no matter where you may find yourself in your life, uh, no matter the pit you may feel like you're in, can I tell you, you have not caught God off guard. You have not caught him by surprise. He's not looking at you saying, well, I don't know what we're going to do. He's in a hopeless situation. You may feel like you're hopeless, but I come to tell you, you are not without hope. And so he told him in verse 24, he said, therefore, thus saith the Lord God of hosts. He said, be not afraid of the Assyrian. Yes, he's going to smite you. Yes, there will be some oppression. Yes, he's going to come against you. But it's just for a little while and it's going to cease because there is coming a day of redemption. There is coming a day of salvation. And I want you to catch this here because God gave them three descriptions of what that redemption would look like. He reminds them in verse 26. He said it will be like the slaughter of Midian at the rock of Oreb when Gideon came in and he killed the enemy that was coming against Israel. He described it as a death of the enemy. First thing he describes is death. The Bible says that we are crucified with Christ. And the way that we identify with the death of Jesus Christ is in repentance. When we repent before God, we are dying out to self. It's putting myself upon the altar and saying no to my will and yes to the will of God. It's a turning away saying I was going this way but now I'm going to go in another direction. I'm going to go in the direction of the Lord. That was the first thing he described. Then in verse, uh, in that same verse he said as his rod was upon the sea so shall he lift it up after the manner of Egypt. He describes when the people of God were coming out of Egypt. And the Bible says they were coming out of Egypt and they came to the Red Sea. And the Egyptian armies are barreling in behind them on chariots coming to kill them. And they're at an impossible situation. They cannot go across the Red Sea. And it looks as if there was no hope. And then the Bible says Moses stretches forth his rod and God parts the waters and they walk through on dry land. 
And the Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, and I didn't give this to our media team, but 1 Corinthians 10 and verse 1, Paul says, Brethren, I would not have you ignorant, but I would have you know that all, somebody say all, all of your fathers, if they made it out of Egypt, if they made it out of the house of bondage, if they made it out of the slavery, there was only one way that they made it out. He said it's because they were baptized unto Moses by cloud and by sea. If they made it out, if they had redemption, it's because they were baptized by the Spirit and they were baptized by the water. And you know what the Bible says after they had come out on the other side of the Red Sea? The Bible says the waters collapsed upon those Egyptians and there was not so much as one Egyptian that made it out alive. And you know what happens when you go down in waters of baptism in Jesus' name? There is not so much as one sin that comes out of the water because baptism is for the remission of sins. That's why you must be baptized in Jesus' name because every sin of your past, every failure that was behind you, it is cleansed, it is washed in the name of Jesus. Oh, would you clap your hands unto the Lord? And so I want to let you know today, if you've never been baptized in Jesus' name, it is the will of God. If you desire to be obedient to the Lord, then before you leave this house today, you ought to just go ahead and get baptized in Jesus' name. That's what being born of the water is. And it washes away your sins. And then he said in verse 27, it shall come to pass. And if you notice, it's kind of like what Peter said on the day of Pentecost. They were gathered together in an upper room, and God had poured out his spirit. There was about 120 people, and the spirit of the Lord came in. And the people that were looking on, they thought, these people are crazy. They must be drunk. The assistant pastor where I grew up in Nebraska, I heard him tell the story a number of times. The first time he ever came to that church, that Pentecostal church, he was sitting there in the middle of worship. And he said somebody came running by him. They were running the aisles. But he thought the church, there must be a fire. And he got up and he started running too. Thought they were going to run out of the church building. And then he found out, no, there, there, that wasn't the kind of fire that it was. And, and he thought, man, these people are crazy. Until God got a hold of his life and baptized him with the fire of the Holy Ghost. But the people, they're looking on and they're saying, these people are drunk, something's not right. They're, they're out of their mind. And Peter gets up and he lets them know, no, they're not drunk as he supposed. But this is that which was prophesied by the prophet Joel that in the last days saith God I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy and your young men shall dream dreams and your old men shall dream dreams and young men would see visions. He said this is the promise of the outpouring of the spirit of God. And Peter went on to declare and to preach unto them about Jesus uh, whom they had crucified. And the Bible says in verse 37, they were pricked in their heart. It moved them. They were touched and they were, they were convicted by the preaching of the word of God. And so they asked the question to Peter and the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? What is the response to this that you have preached to us today? And it was then in Acts chapter 2 in verse 38 uh, answering that question that then Peter said unto them. Somebody say repent and be baptized. Every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. And then just like Isaiah 20, 10 and 27 declared, you, there is coming a shall. Peter said, you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. For the promise is unto you and to your children and to all that are afar off. Even as many as the Lord our God shall call. Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. It's the anointing of the Holy Ghost, and it is the only thing that will destroy the yoke. And can I tell you today, there is a yoke upon this generation. Last time I looked at the statistics, suicide was the second leading cause of death among those aged 10 to 34. 
And Generation Z is by the largest number of any generation before rejecting even a basic belief in God. And it is a yoke of spiritual wickedness that would rob this generation of their God-given purpose. And so can I tell you today that when the young man walks into the house of the Lord and he's got anger and rebellion in his heart, he doesn't need a gifted speaker or an orator, but he needs an encounter with the anointing of the Holy Ghost. When the young child walks into the church house and they come from a broken home and they've got all kinds of things of the world going on in their life, they don't need a talented singer or a talented musician, but they need an anointed singer. They need an anointed musician. When the backslider walks back into the church house and they've got hurt and they've got pain, they need to walk into an atmosphere not unlike today where the men and women of God have gathered together. And because of your prayer life and your walk in obedience to the word of the Lord, when we gather together as the body, there is an anointing that can destroy every yoke and lift every burden in the name of Jesus. That right here in this house today, we would allow there to be that anointing that would would flow and would begin to lift up those burdens and destroy those jokes that are binding and that are hindering. Hallelujah. Mm. Tell you a story about a little girl. There was a little girl at music and get ready to come little girl that grew up in a little trailer park outside of Little Rock, Arkansas. And she grew up in a home where she watched her mom get married four or five different times to different men. Every one of the men that walked into that home, they were drunks, they were alcoholics, they were abusive physically and verbally in that household. This little girl became what we would call a bus kid. She started getting rides to a Pentecostal church. She stepped into a church where she felt the power of the Holy Ghost, the anointing of the Holy Ghost. And, and as a young child, God filled her with the baptism of the Holy Ghost. And I wish her testimony was that her parents and family followed after her, but they never did. All by herself, something got a hold of her life. She gave her life to the Lord, and she did not look back. She went on to go to Texas Bible College where she married a preacher, became a woman of prayer, and they moved up to the state of Nebraska to help start a church. That little girl, that was my mom. That was where she came from. And while every metric and statistic of the world would say she should have followed in the same pattern, in the same lifestyle, and been bound by the same bondage and the same yoke, I'm so thankful. I'm just here as a testimony of the power of the anointing of the Holy Ghost. And so I, I was raised in this, uh, but I come from a family tree that was not. I, I can look back on my family tree and I can say, look what the Lord has done. Look what the anointing of the Holy Ghost can do. Doesn't matter what family you come from. Doesn't matter what household you were born into. God doesn't care about any of that. He just wants to know, will you make yourself available unto him? He doesn't care what your past is. He doesn't even care what your present is. He just wants to know right now where you stand. Would you say, Lord, here I am God I'm available unto you oh I wonder would you stand with me right now all over this house the anointing of the Holy Ghost is in this place and there's victory that's available in this house there's an anointing that can destroy every hoke and lift up every burden and there is a desire that God would call somebody today that God's saying come on I've got a place for you in my kingdom I know where you've been I, I know where you may have been living and in what things may have been going on but he just wants to know would you let me place my hand of anointing upon your life I wonder right now, would you lift up your hands unto the Lord and begin to call upon Him? Lord, we can do nothing on our own. Lord, it's not in us. It's not in my ability. It's not in my might, my power. 
But Lord, it's in you, it's in your spirit, God. And Lord, we understand and we humble ourselves before you because we need the anointing of the Holy Ghost. We need the baptism of the Holy Ghost. We need the anointing, God, to destroy the yokes and lift the burdens in our world and in our city, God, in every lost soul, God. And so we want to be your hands and we want to be your feet. I want to invite you right now, church. I wonder if we might gather together at an altar. I wonder if we might gather together at an altar this morning as we seek after the Lord and we pray and we allow the anointing of the Holy Ghost to sweep all over this house. Come on, I'm inviting you right now. You'd step out in faith. Come on, let the Holy Ghost draw right now. Come on, step out of where you are. Would you make your way down to an altar as you begin to pray? There is an anointing in this house right now. That's right. Come on. Let's press in a little bit. Come on. There's an anointing here today. God, we need the anointing of the Holy Ghost. Lord, let it be like rivers of living water. Lord, it's got to be in you I live. It's in you I move. It's in you I have my being, Lord. God, I need a saturation of your spirit upon my life. Lord, from the top of my head to the sole of my feet. Lord, let your spirit fall fresh on me.